You're listening to the LA Football Podcast. Hey, what's going on, Los Angeles? Welcome to the LA Football Show here on the LA Football Network, live on the Mightier 1090 ESPN Radio. It is a beautiful Friday in the Los Angeles area. The sun is out. It is warming up, starting to feel like spring finally. I've been wearing sweaters all week, which is weird in L.A. in May. But here we are and excited to talk some football Fridays with you all. Joined as always by the madman, Jamal Maddie. What's up, brother? How are we doing? Happy Friday. Doing well, Rai. Happy Friday to you. Excited to get into it as always. And big Friday here in L.A. with Game 6 Warriors and Lakers. Let's hope our Lakers close it out. And uh for the right to play your Denver Nuggets. So that should be a really fun one. Yes, my Nuggets looked good last night, taking care of business down in the Valley, uh, down in Phoenix. And, you know, I know they're shorthanded, but hey, my Nuggets looked like the best team in basketball last night. So it was a it was a good feeling and it'd be fun. You know, I think the three of the last four uh, Western Conference Finals, the Nuggets have been and they've lost to the Lakers. So it'd be fitting to hopefully get that redemption maybe we'll see <laughs> absolutely i mean look the the joker uh nikola jokic i mean there there's a very clear argument to be made that he's the best player in basketball right now and the most skilled player in basketball mm-hmm. right now so if the lakers are fortunate enough to to get by the warriors and and close out that dynasty the, jokic is going to be a handful ad is going to have to be not his nickname which is currently alternate days he's going to have to be an everyday guy <laughs> yeah. Uh, in order to handle the the Joker. Yeah, exactly. Should be a lot of fun. So uh, we will see how tonight goes down for the Lakers. Uh, Right now, though, we're talking UCLA. This is going to be our UCLA Bruins segment, talking um, kind of futures with them as the the win totals came out. According to BetOnline, our sponsor, head to betonline.ag today. Use promo code BELIEVE. Gets you a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. You can go and bet on this after our Glorious talking about it and hopefully making you feel better about it. But currently on Bet Online, UCLA has the over under win total at eight and a half games. Um, and you know, to me, it was a little bit interesting. USC was at nine and a half, so nothing, nothing crazy there, just a game difference. But in, in college football, that is kind of a rather large difference when you think about it a full game. And UCLA does play 12 games this year, so basically has them losing three to four games. So We'll talk about it, obviously, for the next 20 minutes or so, but just from the jump, just kind of your thoughts on that evaluation by the the Vegas betters. Yeah, Ryan, I mean, it was interesting. I think Vegas seemed a little bit conservative across the board. I I think that, you know, eight and a half for UCLA feels a little bit under, and truthfully, nine and a half for SC feels a little under as well. And so I think there's there's some conservatism that's that's into play here. Or, you know, you can look at it one of two ways, that – uh, you know, the LA football network and, and folks that are really the experts feet on the ground that maybe they're, you know, sort of overly evaluating their teams or the fact that more of the national media outlets because of a lack of exposure, because of a lack of nuance and detail to each of these teams is under evaluating, uh, you know, the LA teams primarily because of a West Coast bias and a perception of the Pac-12. I, I certainly think it's the latter and I, I think that, that UCLA, you know, spoiler alert here, I think UCLA is going to be over the eight and a half. Yeah, I would, you know, we'll get into it, but I would hammer that eight and a half. So I was like surprised by it because it felt low, but as a better, I would be happy because I'm like, okay, that's a no brainer. Hit the over. I mean, nine wins seems very attainable. Nine and three season would be definitely a letdown, I think, for this team based on what we've seen in spring camp so far, based on the excitement we have with the new coaches on staff, the new transfers in, the new recruits in, obviously the excitement at the quarterback position. There's unknown at the quarterback position, but the unknown is kind of a, if you can call it a good unknown, unknowns are never necessarily good, but it's there's a lot of talent there. I think there's there's not going to be a huge drop-off in terms of what we saw from DTR last year to whether it is Chase Garbers or Dante Moore this year, just because the talent is certainly there. It'll be obviously how well they feel as a starter being first time starters for the both of them. So that'll be the one unknown, if you will. So, um, but you know, you look at this Jamal and it's fitting, obviously the NFL schedules dropped yesterday, which we will be getting into later in the program, talking Ram schedules and Chargers schedules. So it's fitting. We are talking schedule and, and win totals. And when you look at their schedule here, so non-conference and we've, I think we've kind of talked their schedule a little bit, in the past, but you got coastal Carolina, San Diego state and NC central 
as their non-conference. So I wouldn't say a a bloodbath of a non-conference, but, I, you know, Coastal and San Diego State certainly are, are very good football teams in their respective conferences. So, I mean, those are not gimmies. And then you look at their, their interconference. Obviously, they get Utah, they get Oregon State, and they get USC. Those are kind of the big three in-conference ones. So with this over-under, it's basically those three in-conference games. It's almost like they're saying UCLA is going to lose all of them. And they, or, or they're going to definitely have one lesser opponent loss in this in the schedule. Yeah, Ryan. I mean, I think when you look at the schedule, it really does come down to those three road games. The, the at Utah, at Oregon State, at USC. And then you've got nine games that you're clearly better talent-wise and, you know, situationally. So that's really where I think it splits. Truthfully, what they're saying is that, you know, potentially – the interesting thing with UCLA is, and I, I can sort of understand why the betters have put it at eight and a half, because UCLA historically always loses one game they're not supposed to lose. And we saw that last year with Arizona. We saw it the year before with Fresno State. On and on we can go. Obviously, the struggles against the Cincinnati's and the San Diego States of the world in the chips early years, well documented. And this goes back to Mora. This goes back to New Heisel. This goes back to Durrell. So essentially, you know, the conservative stance would say, look, at USC, that's going to be probably a tough game. With, you know, you're going to have a first time, first year starting quarterback, regardless, to go up against the Heisman winner and the Cauley. That's a little bit of a tall ask. Going to Corvallis, we saw what Oregon State did to SC last year, and Corvallis almost pulled that off. Everything Jonathan Smith has got going on how strong they are on the offensive line, how strong they are at running back, very physical front seven. Now you add DJ Oliangalele, you know, that seems like a formidable game. And then at Utah has always sort of been a house of horrors for UCLA, certainly in the late Mora and now into the chip era, obviously exercised some demons last year, albeit at the Rose Bowl. So there's a little bit of thinking of saying, hey, historically and just on paper those look like three tough games and if UCLA sort of blows a game that they're not supposed to maybe it's home for Washington State maybe it's it's one of those games against one of these high octane teams they let them in the game long enough make a couple of boneheaded turnovers a couple of untimely penalties all of a sudden you know you're behind the eight ball there so I think that's where the thinking lies I don't necessarily agree with it but I understand Mm -hmm the framework of the argument to me what this really comes down to if you really break down UCLA position by position Ryan I think we've talked a lot about the Garbers Dante Moore battle that's that's where this is sitting right now in the quarterback room and I think it's abundantly clear having been to spring practice that Ethan Garbers knows this offense a lot better than Dante Moore does but Dante Moore in terms of just skill level and poise and intangibles and playmaking is better than Ethan Garbers, even at 17. So the question now is going to become over the summer, does Dante Moore absorb enough of the playbook where he closes that playbook and offensive knowledge gap to the point where now you favor him over Garbers because of all of those other things. And I think that's kind of where we're sitting at at quarterback and running back. Right. I mean, it's such a deep room. I think TJ Harden is very clearly RB one. And then so much talk about Carson Steele, the leading returning rusher in NCAA football, 1,556 yards at Ball State last year. But I actually think Colson Yankoff might beat out Carson Steele for RB2. And so think about that, Ryan, that last year's leading NCAA rusher that's coming back, okay? He was ninth last year in rushing. The top eight guys all declared. So he is the leading returning rusher. He might be third string running back at UCLA. I mean, think about how deep that running back room is. And then at wide receiver, Ryan, J. Michael Sturdivant and Kyle Ford have just lapped the field in terms of the rest of the roster. This is the highest quality top end receivers UCLA has had in over 20 years. And I think what they can bring to the table there is really, really exciting. I think there's less of an emphasis on the tight ends because – I think Chip, for the first time, has these toys and these weapons on the outside where he doesn't need to do as much bunch formation. And then we've also been just been salivating about this front seven. You got Latu coming back. You got Moasau coming back. You got the Murphy twins coming back. You got Jay Toya. You got, you know, Williams, the transfer from Oregon. 
you just have all of these pieces, not to mention Oladijo, this wide, rangy linebacker from Cal. You're going to get John John Vons in this hybrid linebacker safety role. And then you got a really feisty group of secondary players led by Devin Kirkwood, but there's a lot of other guys that are vying for playing time. So when you look at this roster top to bottom, you're like, this is the most talented team UCLA has had since probably Brett Hundley's junior year and one of the most talented rosters they've really had, you know, since the turn of the century. So when you sort of look at it from that perspective and you say this over under, it's, it's very conservative. Now, the one caveat to this team is offensive line. Yep. Offensive line right now is, I would say, at a non-passing level for Pac-12 contention. This offensive line got manhandled by that front seven consistently in spring ball. And so, you know, one, one could make the argument, hey, is the front seven really that good? Yeah, the front seven is good, but that offensive line should have and could have done a better job. And so you got a whole stage coming in from Purdue. You got DiGiorgio, who was a starter last year. Those guys were in and out of, of the lineup in spring. So I think rhythm was a bit of an issue. And they're leaning very heavily on Wiley from Colorado, the transfer. They've also got a transfer from Old Dominion. So the linchpin here, Ryan, is offensive line. And yep. if the offensive line can get to a B, B-plus level, even a B level, I think eight and a half is very conservative, and you're looking at a 10-2 and two football team. However, if this offensive line doesn't make the jump that we needed to see from the outcomes of spring practice, then I think there's a real conversation here of they could even slip down to eight and four just because of how potent – this conference is. Yeah. And, you know, looking at the offensive line, it's, it's obviously a wait and see and hypothetical. If we want to trust the coaching staff, they, they certainly proved their salt last year. You know, those first game or two, the offensive line did not look good. It was very concerning. Like this is going to be a long year. And they ended up being arguably the best unit in the entire pac 12, which is the kind of the transformation they made throughout the season. Now they had a lot of returning pieces. They had a lot of you know, guys that had been there, John Gaines had been there for, for quite some time and, and some staples on the line that now they have lost the draft. But if they can get the gel from these transfers in and maybe it'll take a game or two and hopefully they can, you know, weather the storm in this three game non-conference schedule and, and get through it, then I think hopefully we'll see this, this offensive line kind of transform like we saw last year. Now, will it reach those heights, reach those levels? We shall see. Um, and obviously the, the unknown at quarterback definitely adds into that in terms of chemistry and reliance on one another to kind of do your job. So that definitely, you're absolutely right. That is kind of the, the faltering point of, is this a 10, 11, 12 win team, or is this a seven, eight, nine win team, um, when it comes down to it. So quickly about the quarterbacks, and then I want to go to the other games. I got a question for you that we didn't mention, um, you know, we haven't really mentioned this much when it comes to Dante Moore and Garbers. We talked about how if Garbers wins a job, that's not the end of the world. That just, you know, that shows how well prepared Garbers has been. Dante Moore obviously has the talent. If he wins a job, great. You know, he may be go down as one of the greatest UCLA quarterbacks to ever wear the wear the um, baby blue. But one thing we haven't talked about that I just kind of thought about as you were you were talking there that you know we could potentially see a scenario play out similar to you know, at Alabama with Jalen Hurts and Tua Tungavailoa. You know, Tua Tungavailoa was the incoming freshman, all the talent in the world, big recruit. Jalen Hurts was the incumbent, kind of won the job. It was all year, though. It was like, okay, when is when is Tua going to take over? When is Tua going to take over? Jalen was playing very well. They obviously got the national title game. They make the switch in the title game to Tua, and Tua leads them, obviously, to a national title win. I wouldn't want to see it happen, take that long for that to happen, but it wouldn't shock me, Jamal, if we maybe see a, where Chase Garbers starts the season off and he's playing well. He doesn't get benched because of playing poorly, but eventually Dante Moore being more in the system with more practices under his belt eventually just overtakes him and takes that team to the next level. So that to me might actually be more of a realistic scenario than seeing Dante Moore start day one or Garbers start from day one and hold the, hold the starting job for the entire season. No, it's such a great point, Ryan, and I love the analogy because it's very apt in a lot of ways. You've got the incumbent who's very experienced, very knowledgeable, very stable quarterback, and then you've got this wild card, this dynamo in, in Dante Moore, and how quickly he absorbs is really going to be the question. For me, if you start Garbers, when you look at how this schedule breaks down, Coastal, San Diego State, NC Central, you're not making a change after those three games. 
yeah. then you sort of get into the conference season. So, you know, if this is a, a six and O football team, even if Garbers isn't necessarily setting the world on fire, I have a hard time believing you're going to switch a, 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 an incumbent quarterback on a six and O team for a true freshman, 18 year old. So yeah. the only way I see a switch taking place is if Garbers loses one of those games that they're not supposed to lose. And then that sort of opens the door for, oh, we got this this three-game gauntlet here at the end with Oregon State, Utah, USC. We really need to have as much explosiveness on the field as possible. So that's kind of where I Mm -hmm. see it shake out. I think, Ryan, if it ended right now, I think Garbers is the starter just because of that knowledge. But I think it would take him needing to sort of do something to lose the job for more to kind of come in and be that starter than just Garber's kind of doing his thing and more just shows out so much in practice that you make a switch, even if Garber's, you know, doesn't make a mistake or doesn't lose a game or doesn't throw a lot of interceptions. So I think that's how I could see that narrative play out there. And for me, Ryan, just overall in terms of schedule, I think this is the year UCLA is going to beat Utah on Utah. I just think that Utah has yeah. lost so much uh, you know, obviously they got Cam rising back and, you know, you can never underestimate that. But Utah is a team, you talk about losing Keithy and Kincaid and Clark Phillips and just really key pieces to the, the equation here. I think they're deep, uh, you know, with Jackson at running back and sort of a quartet of running backs there. But Utah is very much like an Iowa, a Minnesota of the West. They, they just don't retool with four and five stars. It's a developmental program mm-hmm. that allows them to sort of be really good every couple of years. Now, they've put two straight together, obviously. But even in those two straight years, they've had ups and downs. They've had changes. They've had losses in the non-conference. So they haven't exactly been dominant these last two years. They've just kind of been the last team standing. So to me, if it ended right now, if I had to sort of make a prediction right now about this season, I see UCLA beating Utah. I think they're going to fall to Oregon State. I think that SC-UCLA game is going to decide a berth in the Pac-12 title game. I'm giving the edge to USC right now, just going to kind of give in talent. So I think they're going to win two of those three games. But then I think if I don't see the improvement in the offensive line, I think there's going to be a game that bites them that shouldn't. And so I think right now I see them still at the over, but I think I have them right now at nine and three. And I think if we can Mm -hmm. see the improvement – at the offensive line, I think nine and three becomes 10 and two. Yeah. I feel similar. That leads perfectly into my, I guess now final question where I at about, you know, three minutes left before the break. Um, but when you look at this and we'll, we'll say that they make it through their non-conference and you, you have that slip up game and you look at, so you got Washington state at home, you got Stanford, you got Colorado, Arizona, Arizona state and Cal. Out of those games, and you know, this is from a big lens, still far away from the fall. But out of those games, which one? And Arizona might even be called a, a trap game because they're actually going to be very good this year. We've talked for the last nine months about how Arizona might be the sleeper in the Pac-12 this coming season. So maybe we can even throw them out. But of the others, Arizona State, Colorado, Stanford, Cal, like who of those games actually kind of concerns you the most? That could be this year's Arizona from last year. I think this year's Arizona for UCLA, you know, when you look at Stanford and Cal, they're really rebuilding. I think Colorado, even though there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of rebuilding going on there. I think Arizona State is also kind of a program in transition. And I think they're going to be ready for Arizona this year, given what happened last year. I don't think that's going to be a letdown. To me, the one that gives me a little bit of angst is Washington State, because I think Cam Ward has all of the skill set that Jalen uh, Jalen Delora did last year. And obviously Delora is still in the conference this year, but he's the one who can strain you vertically. He can strain you with his scrambles. He can sort of improv. He can break down a defense in terms of situationally. And, you know, he has the ability to kind of go shootout for shootout here with a great offense. So if, if Garbers, let's say, isn't humming, you know, a pick here, maybe a fourth down stop there, a field goal where it should have been a touchdown. You know, that's where it gets a little bit dicey. You keep them in the game for two or three quarters. They get really confident. Something happens in the fourth and they steal one. So I kind of have my eye on that Washington State game, Ryan, as sort of the watch out game. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, that's a a team that 
I don't want to say they underperformed last year, but we're like, they, they showed flashes of being really good. Um, and then just could never put like a full 60 minutes together, even in some of those games against, you know, SC and whatnot. It's like, Oh, okay. This team looks pretty good. And then they kind of fell apart there later in the game. So they're definitely a team I think could put together. And, you know, this conference is just so deep from top to bottom. I mean, even the worst team in the conference, which you could argue probably Stanford or Cal, but you know, they're still, blue bloods in the conference that that could strike if the iron's hot if need be um and so it, it's really no gimme games in this in this conference like they're i mean i feel like for history in this conference has been pretty deep it's other conferences that are very top heavy which we've talked about a lot so uh but yeah eight and a half over under on bet online you can go to bet online that ag use that promo code believe to get a welcome bonus and you can bet on the over i think is clear what you do here, even if it's a disappointing season, I think we still get to nine wins uh, with those three losses and would go over the eight and a half. So that's all the time we got for UCLA talk. Got to take a quick break. We'll be back with uh, some SC talk. And obviously we'll be talking Rams and chargers schedule. Another great chargers schedule release on social media. So we'll be talking that this is the LA football show. Keep it right here. You're listening to the L.A. Football Podcast. 